Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome back after a, I hope you had a good tea, coffee, whatever. Uh, so before uh, before tea break, uh, I requested you to just see that you know just take a perspective th that how much area would be required just to deal with the landfills, and the question will be that whether this area is available in the cities in future or not and if not then what to do with this whole management system okay uh, in terms of so it's not that the municipal solid waste management we do we do for good reasons but it's also by law and it's very much written in municipal solid waste management and handling rules 2000 uh, in fact we are about to have uh, new rules which are under discussion and some kind of uh, it's it's in public domain people the, the the comments are asked by different agencies it's under discussion so we will have new rules actually so whatever was not written in uh, in this rules will be certainly in the new rules uh, it's very clearly written that it's the municipalities who are responsible for the whole waste management uh, in city including collection storage segregation transportation, processing and disposal of MSW. And the interesting part is that as per rule, the biodegradable material should not go to the landfills. So that means anything which is biodegraded, biodegradable should not be sent to the landfills. Th that means whatever uh, system we have to develop, we certainly need waste energy, uh, anaerobic digestion or the composting kind of systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, we will see that how the new rules comes in and what are the different changes in that, but this everything is as per the rules. So this is the environmental hierarchy of MSW management. You should not produce at first level, you should reduce whatever waste reduction, that is what I tell to teachers, the three R's, reduce, reuse and recycle. And then biodegradation is the next choice. Then course waste energy of course biodegradation also can produce some energy but then thermal is put below that and the next uh, is sanitary landfilling with biogas recovery with methane recovery and the last option to try should be the sanitary landfilling but of course uh, the open dumping nowhere comes into picture because that is not a acceptable in any ways in terms of the environment okay so uh, you know, uh, everyone and maybe your students will also be knowing that uh, what are reduce and reuse and recycle. So probably I do not spend much time on that even neither in the class nor here. But uh, this is amazing actually, this especially the recycling, the concept of recycling and of course others too is very amazing. So for example, if I have, a, if I have to uh, produce a Coca-Cola or a soda cane, which is made of aluminium. So if I have to produce it from virgin materials, let us say the new material I have to use, uh, you may be knowing that for that the energy required to produce it from the recycled one, that means which is once used and put it back, it will be 90 percent less. So recycling is such amazing thing. For example, we are saving our resources, we are uh, saving energy in many, many ways and you know we are uh, even going towards sustainable management, sustainable development because who knows that you may be knowing, you may be reading that many of our materials which uh, probably we will not, will not be available even in, in few years. Many of the uh, materials which for example is required for catalyst etc. they may not be available because you know once we do not recycle them, put it into landfill etc. they are gone. In fact, it is very difficult to get it back from there. So recycling in many ways is, is amazing. We uh, should encourage recycling in different ways. Uh, of course, uh, in India we have uh, a good uh, decent recycling but largely by the informal sector. We are not doing it in formal. So that means that it is only based on economics. It is not based on which are important materials. So government has to do something on that in future. It's, I also show this slide to my students. Uh, this is the municipal uh, waste management in 32 European countries. It is uh, the average out. So, but if you see here from last 10 years or, or so from 2001 to 10, the landfilling is going down. 
and incineration is more or less constant and the recycling is increasing day by day. So that means people are moving away from landfilling, reducing the waste going to landfill and moving towards the recycling. You may be uh, knowing that the Germany uh, now they are towards the zero landfill. That means approximately no waste, uh, no solid waste from Germany goes to the landfill. That's uh, you know that's an achievement for a country. But, uh, you know, it's not that simple that we can say, oh, we will start also having zero uh, landfill sites. It's also an integration of the industry so that the material is produced in a such a manner that most of it can be, uh, it can be recycled. Uh, for example, I was, uh, I was discussing it with someone who, is, uh, who works in GIG. Uh, he told that for example, the, the water bottles, for example, in India, if you go to any conference seminar, that's what we get, right? This is plastic bottles. But if you are uh, largely in the seminars or conferences where many people are drinking water, so largely they have these larger bottles. And they are made of glass, okay? And the material quality is such that they can be recycled 10, 12, 15 times, which is very different. In India, we largely use these plastic bottles, okay? So that kind of thinking, that kind of thinking in broader perspective need to be done so that, you know, we can think of having just zero discharge or uh, zero landfilling facilities. Otherwise, it won't come so, so quick, but that is possible. And, you know, we have to study some models and some countries like, uh, for example, Germany, they are how they are able to achieve that. Uh, in many countries, uh, the system which is uh, used is uh, for waste management is called mechanical biological treatment system, famously called MBT. So what they do is they have this waste coming in and then mechanical sorting, they are moving recycling material going to recycling facilities and some rejects which are going to the landfills and largely the biodegradable portion. Uh, which part of that is going by bio de biological degradation happening and gas is produced largely waste energy or even simple gases like carbon dioxide and some uh, liquid waste generated again treated and then RDF and digested. So basically in my mechanical biological treatment system, it is a mechanical system which are largely used for separation and sorting and segregation and even size reduction, etc. And then the biological system used further for the treatment, uh, for the treatment of the waste. And even uh, after biological or even in, in tandem with biological uh, degradation, they are producing RDF and that actually can be even uh, used further for generation of energy. So that kind of uh, system are developed especially in the Europe, but there are some issues of course dealing with them. You see, uh, as I told from, uh, uh, as I told in the previous class also that all our solid waste management system need to be designed uh, for the local condition, number one. It won't be that the system which is working for Europe, for example, straight away work for India, because our waste characteristics are different, our uh, whole system is different. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, I w someone uh, who, who runs a company in, in, in uh, Germany, she told me that, you know, the system which they are using, MBT system in in Germany, if they want to use it in some other country, but if the electricity failure is just for five minutes, that whole system will fail. So then now you can understand that in, in India, in many cities, it, I won't be surprised that there is electricity failure for five minutes or so. So for example, if we bring just a system from other countries and Im implement it, so many of system need to be checked whether they will work for our country or not. So that's a challenge. That's always a challenge. Okay. That's why many of our system are not working in this country. So, uh, I also show this uh, video, which is, uh, uh, which is on YouTube. Uh, so, uh, I ju just want to show you also that how this is done in, uh, in San Francisco, for example. Uh, it may be interesting. I will show it in my class also, depending on whether you would like it or not, you can use it for your teaching purpose. Okay, so uh, so I think uh, you know this this is one example which uh, sometime I, I asked my student to see because it's interesting that uh, different com how the component different components are used and that's so that point is that it's possible to manage uh, the solid waste in the 
in the nicest manner, in the, the best scientific manner. Only the thing is that uh, we have to see that what will be the cost of the waste management and as I mentioned in my first class that how and who will pay it. So this is a kind of assignment I, uh, I give to my student, probably I will leave it for the time being, we can come a little bit later to this. Okay, and this is largely what I what I tell my uh, students what solid waste management. There are many other things which uh, which you can also which can be told. For example, uh, different other technologies, advanced techno technologies, etc. Uh, for example, one new technology is the bioreactor landfills. But remember, this is a class uh, of the students which are from all different streams and. We have a very limited time, four, five hours, so that means we need to see that what should be told. So that's what I, uh, I tell to my uh, student on this. Uh, then I uh, switch to biomedical waste management, but before we go to biomedical waste management, I just want to ask a couple of you that how you deal with this course, so just maybe one, one center should be fine. Tanjabur, Sastra University, hello. So let me ask a question that uh, who is, whosoever is teaching this course there, so what else you teach in solid waste management? Uh, in solid waste management, mm -hmm. we inform students what is solid waste and uh, how the solid waste can be uh, collected, safely transported and uh, then uh, uh, disposed of safely. So these are the points which we uh, deal in the solid waste management. We offer we also tell what are the different types of solid waste as you have mentioned here that uh, municipal solid waste, uh, biomedical waste and electronic waste. Uh, these are the uh, things that we uh, uh, teach in the classes. Okay. Uh, this is a new thing that you have told that uh, they need to be, uh, they need to calculate the solid waste and all. Yeah, okay. Yeah, another, so uh, another point, uh, a question we have. Yeah. Uh, which I have posted, which I have posted it. Okay. And the point is that uh, the <coughs> a lot of uh, waste, thousands of waste pickers, uh, they, their livelihoods are dependent on the municipal solid waste. They pick it and they sell it. Yeah. And once we dispose the, I mean, uh, we generate the power from the solid waste, the livelihood of uh, these uh, thousands of waste pickers in the, especially in the urban area, will be uh, uh, geopardized, geopardized. So, what should we do to rehabilitate these poor waste pickers? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, very good, very good question, and you know, very important question uh, regarding this rag pickers and etc. Uh, you see, first of all, we have to find that what is the right employment for everything, and you know, uh, I have uh, talked to some of rag pickers and I have seen some of rag pickers uh, who are actually collecting waste not necessarily from the generation side from the, but from the ultimately dump site, etc. They are leaving conditions, etc. are really poor, okay. Although we can say that we are, they are getting employment, but probably that is not the right employment and if we see their health conditions, they are in the worst health conditions. But nevertheless, for example, for recycling, reuse, recovery, all, uh, especially for recycling purpose, they can be trained, they can be given proper equipment, etc., proper gears so that, you know, their hands, they are not exposed to different uh, or hazardous or uh, the toxic elements of the, uh, the waste. And they can be made a party to it instead of allowing them to do it independently having, for example, many of NGOs are working on that. So that is possible. But just to think that if one person is earning a thousand rupee by being a rag picker in a month and then we say it's employment, so probably we need to re-see it. We need to relook into whether this even can be called an employment or not. Okay, uh, certainly uh, there are some people getting benefited, but then they can be made party even for our all kind of waste management system. Okay, it doesn't mean that if you have waste energy system, then there won't be recycling and reuse, etc. So those people can be used here. In fact, in a more uh, cleaner manner, in a proper trained and giving them proper uh, gears, which make them safe also. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, so it looks like more or less everything uh, what is taught here is uh, is is told in different uh, different uh, classes. Uh, 
So I, be, I go back to my slides and uh, after I teach solid waste management, the another component I cover as I mentioned in the in the class is the biomedical waste management and uh, and in, in also it sometimes is called hospital waste management. So this uh, in this biomedical waste or hospital waste is a uh, interesting and important component because of certainly because of its characteristics and most importantly it is also generated inside our municipality. Where there will be people there will be health issues, if there are health issues there will be hospital and always there will be biomedical waste generated. So, as per biomedical waste management and handling rules 2011, it is again under the rule. Uh, what is biomedical waste? It is a waste which is generated during the diagnosis, treatment, immunization of human beings or animal or in research activities pertaining to the production or testing of biological. So, it is a little bit interesting and scientific definition, but largely the waste which we generate in our hospitals, in our health clinics nursing homes and medical research facilities which can be solid, liquid, sharps or even laboratory waste that all type of waste actually is called myovetical waste. And in fact, in the waste which is generated inside our hospital etc., there are two components into that. One is infectious waste and another is actually non-infectious waste. So, for example, this human anatomical, surgical waste, animal waste, pathological waste, syringes, tubes, blood bags, etc. They all actually are in can uh, are f uh, they fall in under uh, hospital waste, uh, infectious host hospital waste and the they are just 15 to 20 percent of the total waste generated inside the healthcare units or establishment or in the hospital. And the remaining waste which is as high as 80 to 85 percent in fact generated inside the kitchen offices etc. even from the of kitchen and offices of the hospital or in the other facilities that is actually non-infectious in nature. So, what, what has happened is because in, in many places we have not dealt properly with that. So, what happens is we are not segregating infectious and non-infectious waste and we mixing together. So, eventually the whole waste becomes the biomedical waste and whole waste becomes the infectious waste. So, in fact, we, we are increasing our problem by 4 to 5 times by mixing the both of these wastes. So, if, if we can just segregate first of all infectious and non-infectious waste, our good amount of problem is solved. Okay? Uh, you know, there are different research papers, not many though, but telling that how much of waste is uh, biomedical waste is dealt properly or scientifically and how much not. So, uh, there is a discussion on that. In fact, with the awareness and you know the health concern, people are becoming more and more aware. So, in fact, many of our healthcare establishments in in future will have a proper biomedical waste management system. But uh, one paper published by Mohan Kumar and all in 2011 says that 53 percent of healthcare establishments in India are operating with the, without the obtaining proper authorization from pollution control boards, etc. And only 57 percent of the total waste generated is being treated uh, either through common biomedical waste treatment facilities or in captive treatment facilities. We have across the country 602 biomedical waste incinerators and more than 70 percent of them have actually has air pollution control devices. And then we have uh, more than 2000 autoclaves, approximately 200 microwaves and 8000 or so of shredder used. So, that means uh, we still need to work on, on this issue and especially we have to bring all the small and uh, healthcare units which do not have not have not established a proper biomedical waste facility. Otherwise, you can understand that how dangerous th that can be actually. Uh, what kind of hospital generate how much there is no, uh, there is no uh, good data for that for that matter and there is no uh, the method to calculate but on average each hospital is generated 1.6 kilogram of biomedical waste per day uh, per bad basis that is uh, it could be more in in some hospital it could be less in others but that's the approximate data and as per the rules as per of the biomedical waste management and handling rules every occupier generating biomedical waste irrespective of the quantum of waste comes under the preview of these rules. 
that means every small large clinic should have some kind of biomedical waste management facilities either in individual uh, captive, captive or, uh, or combined facilities and every hospital generating biomedical waste need to set up a requisite biomedical waste treatment facilities as I mentioned earlier. So uh, just to give you a sense that what can happen if we are not doing the proper biomedical waste management. For example, we have this uh, sometime kind, some kind of disease which uh, are communicable. For example, uh, the one which recently has happened is the swine flu, right? So in swine flu, what, hap what happens is the patients generally are kept in a different, uh, in a different ward. So that ward is actually, uh, you can call it a sanitized. You should, uh, everyone is not allowed to go there and they are kept there. But then think of this, if the waste generated from those wards is mixed with the waste generated from other wards and then so many times in many places it is mixed with our municipal solid waste. That means we are actually not controlling our spreading of these diseases like swine flu, etc. in the way because ultimately we are exploring the people. Okay, So the small steps of this separating biomedical waste management are so important that otherwise it can you know jeopard, jeopard our whole whole health issues okay so as i told tell to my student as solid waste municipal solid waste management there are again the elements of biomedical waste management starting with biomedical waste generated then of course we should minimize our production and then identifications you know there are different types of biomedical waste which will come uh, which we, to which we will come in a minute but we have uh, to categorize them it's little bit even more than uh, what we do for our uh, municipal solid waste and once we categorize them we put in color coded uh, bins or colored color coded bags and after that we need to set a schedule of collection within the healthcare premises and also after that we need to uh, then think of a treatment system, whether an on-site or off-site, okay? And then ultimately the disposal and then where should keep the record that where uh, this final our waste is going, okay? So this is the elements of biomedical waste management, similar to municipal solid waste management. But of course, here we need to be a little bit more careful. For example, the even the rules says that the biomedical waste, how for how many do days maximum we can store? I think it's you it shouldn't be more than stored for 48 hours. So all these kinds of rules are there and if you are storing it for 48 hours, where should we store it? What kind of facility should be there? So all these uh, rules are, all, everything is written in biomedical waste management. Okay, so the, as per biomedical waste management rules in India, the waste is uh, categorized into eight categories. Okay, so there's eight categories of waste called category number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And category one, for example, is the human anatomical waste, and category two is the animal waste. It's similarly the animal tissues, organs, and for human waste, it's human tissues and organ, etc. So for all these uh, categories, uh, uh, the in rules, it's very clearly and categorically mentioned that which technology should be used. Okay, for example, this category number one and two, human anatomical and animal based, we should just incinerate it. That means it's not, we are not given a choice, but it's by law that the human anatomical and animal waste should be incinerated. Okay. Similarly, microbiology and biotechnology waste, which contains uh, waste from laboratory cultures, human, animal cell culture, infectious agents, etc., it should be disinfected. And after that, it should be put into secure landfill. So what is a secure landfill? It's similar to our uh, municipal solid uh, solid based landfill, but you know the leachate collection system and liners, etc., are a little bit more sophisticated. That means we have a double uh, leachate collection system and double liner, etc. Okay. So then I, I when I teach this in the class, I ask my student that they should at least remember part of it, and you know many times I you mention them that okay this will be asked in the exam one question will certainly come from this and I nearly ask them to remember that otherwise uh, you know they will many of them won't find it the idea is that at least they should know what in what what are different types of category and what we are doing with the with the waste okay so these eight categories uh, there is no much uh, thing to discuss and only thing is that it if your students can read it once that should be good enough okay 
And this is all about, uh, this is what, about the color coded bins. Uh, there are, for example, yellow, red, blue, and black color coding used in biomedical waste management as per rule 2011. For example, this category 1, 2, 5, 6 waste comes, uh, should be stored in yellow containers, in the yellow, in the yellow, yellow colored bags, and the treatment option for them is incineration. Similarly, the uh, the category 3, 4, 7 uh, uh, biomedical waste should be stored in red bags and it should be treated as per given in the previous schedule which I just showed you. Uh, similarly, blue, uh, the category 8, uh, uh, category 8 uh, waste should be stored in uh, blue bags and the non, uh, the, the black, uh, you know, the municipal waste be generated should be stored in the, uh, in the black bags. Um, if you see this slide, many times you will find that we are saying always non-chlorinated plastic bags, non-chlorinated plastic bags. So why it is so? Because if you remember, I told you that if I incinerate a waste which has chlorine into that and which has hydrocarbon into this, so ultimately that will lead to the production of dioxin and fuel. So that is the same case here because a good amount of our biomedical waste can be incinerated or should be incinerated. So if we have chlorinated plastic, if we burn that, then probably we we'll end up having the, uh, the dioxin and furon formation. That's why many of our these bags are recommended to be non-chlorinated plastic bags. Okay, and then when we, uh, when we talk about the chemical treatment for the disinfection purpose, they say that we should use sodium hypochlorite solution, 1% sodium hypochlorite solution. but because, uh, but for the waste which can be incinerated or should be incinerated cannot be pre-treated with the chemicals, for example, with hypochlorite. Otherwise, this chlorine will, be, uh, will, will go into your waste and will lead to the formation of dioxin and furan. So all these kind of rules very categorically and very nicely written uh, and if we follow them probably a good amount of our problem will be solved. Okay, so this is uh, a summary of how much waste is generated in India, what is the issue, you know, many of you even wrote in Moodle that they are in, in the small cities, the waste is not uh, properly treated and sometimes even mixed with the municipal solid waste, but at least by rule, now we should have categorized it in different uh, categories and put it into different containers so that everyone can know that which waste is what, okay. So, uh, regarding the treatment, you know, uh, every one of you know that what are the different treatment options for biomedical waste. I uh, spend uh, approximately 10 minutes in my class to talk about the treatment options. So this is the, the first uh, treatment option uh, which is called uh, needle cutter and syringe destroyer. It's, it's a very simple. I would say the instrument which will cost you less than 1000 rupees, what is that? You just put your needle here and break it. And similarly in this, you put it there and just switch on the button, it just breaks. So what is the idea? So that, you know, this needles shouldn't be used or reused for uh, again for some purpose. This small thing can help us in many ways because you may be knowing that 10 years ago there was a little bit issues that you know a lot of biomedical uh, syringes etc are recycled I shouldn't say recycled but just reused like that so probably it was leading to spreading of many diseases so the idea is I think it's now mandatory that all hospitals should simply break their needles once they are used okay so that it cannot be used further so in fact this 500 plus rupees instrument or a small dabba actually it can it can solve our purpose and then uh, there are incinerators you know the incineration as i mentioned for example for uh, schedule uh, for for class uh, 1 and 2 uh, materials this incinerators are recommended in fact this incineration is a good technology for uh, for biomedical based because of course then there is no question of uh, having uh, infectious material going in and around. Okay, so this is uh, an example of uh, having an incinerator for uh, biomedical waste. I just uh, please spend one minute on 
understanding what are the different components of the incinerator this is and then I will explain to you. So just try to understand this for one minute and then I will explain you what is in the incinerator. So uh, this is a schematic of an incinerator. It has basically these incinerators for the, the biomedical waste has two chamber which is called primary chamber and secondary chamber. And uh, generally in many times we have to put additional fuel for combustion purpose here in the primary chamber and these few gases which goes out they are further burned in secondary chamber that means we need another burner here. So it is a primary burner and secondary burner. And after that, the flue gases which are coming out, they cannot be allowed to go to the atmosphere, right? Because, you know, there's, there, these gases may be toxic in nature. So basically, you need air pollution control devices. For example, one which is shown here is the Venturi scrubber, which is basically scrubbing or sharing your uh, uh, solid, um, uh, solid particles as well as few acid gases and removed here. And then you can have another air pollution control devices depending upon what is required. And then this is there is a, this is a stack. Okay, so if you see the incinerators used for uh, biomedical waste, as per rule, we should have two chambers for them. This is called primary chamber and secondary chamber. And the, I, this uh, this is at elevated temperatures. So the idea is that all the waste should pass uh, through the secondary chamber and should have at least spent one second of one second there, so that. Uh, they identified that many of the compounds in biomedical waste, their uh, destruction can happen, their destruction removal efficiency is more than 99.9% .9 at temperature more than 1000 degrees. So this temperature has high temperature as this is low temperature. So because we want to have uh, to pass this waste or flue gases through 1000 plus temperature, that's why we have separate one. Otherwise, if we put the whole uh, single chamber system, then probably we need a, to have to maintain the thousand plus degree temperature in the one reactor itself which eventually will make, make it expensive. So that is why we have the two chamber system and as per law we have been given the operating standards that for example the combustion efficiency should be more than 99 percent. The combustion efficiency is calculated as percentage of CO2 divided by percentage of CO2 plus percentage of carbon monoxide that means it tells you how much of carbon is actually convert into CO2. This is by law. Okay, it is written in the law itself to make it sure that your all your rubber combustion system are working efficiently. And for example, as I mentioned, the temperature of the primary chamber should be in between 750 to 850 degree centigrade and the secondary chamber should be between 1000 to 1100 degree centigrade. Okay, so that is why the secondary chamber is on the higher temperature. Similarly, uh, Emission standards, so these were basically we have two standards, one are operating standards and the second one are emission standards. For example, your particulate matter in the flue gases should not be more than 150 uh, milligram per normal meter cube. For NOx it should not be more than 450, for HCl they should not be more than 50 uh, milligram per meter cube and the minimum stack height shall be 30 meters above ground. Okay, so th that is an interesting idea especially for the dispersion purpose. But remember that many of our houses or many of our uh, buildings inside cities are even more than 30 meters. So that could be interesting to see that whether this stack height is enough or what can we do on that. And the VOCs shouldn't in ash shall not be more than 0.01 percent. So that means even if we do incineration there are operating and emission standards kept for these incinerators and uh, the regulator the the operator has to follow them so in fact it's a it's a one way of controlling the emissions if they can fulfill this standard probably some of things uh, are saved uh, you can see that although i mentioned that there can be dioxin and uh, furon formations but there is nothing mentioned about those component here in the biomedical waste incineration Another technology uh, which is uh, used uh, f for the biomedical uh, treatment, biomedical waste treatment is called microwaving. So microwaving is, uh, uh, is nothing but similar to the same concept which is used for our microbes 
uh, in our houses. We are using more or less everyone is using you now microwaves. So basically, it's the energy, the thermal energy produced produced by microwave, which will basically disinfect your waste. Remember that this will not burn it or something like that, but it will simply disinfect it. So for example, what we do is we grind that waste and put it at uh, under the high intensity microwaves. Radiation could be as high as 300 to 300,000 megahertz. And basically what it does is it effectively neutralize your biological waste and then that means that is actually disinfected. Uh, the simplest, another one for disinfection purpose used is called autoclave. This is uh, one of autoclave. Uh, this is uh, the vertical one and then the horizontal one. This is nothing but a simple, I would say, the extension of a pressure cooker where we build pressure. And when the steam is built at high pressure and of course then high temperature, if it then it's passed through the waste, it the the bio, bio what do you call the infectious material is getting disinfected basically. The whole idea is disinfection. Okay, so and once we have done this microwave autograbing, of course we have to ultimately dispose it this waste further. Okay, many of you may be having this kind of instruments in your uh, in your labs for for the microbial disinfection. The another technology which is uh, used for uh, for waste uh, biomedical waste treatment is called gamma radiations or irradiation technology. Basically, the these gamma radiations are produced from a cobalt source and they are actually used to sterilize the base. Basically, all these technologies are used to disinfect the waste. Of course, this uh, technology is a little bit expensive. Uh, there are concerns whether this radiation, uh, this radiation can expo, uh, can ex these workers who work on these systems can be exposed. So there is a lot of concern because they are the, the radioactive substances, but that is also used for, especially in Gulf countries, there are for in some few places that is used for biomedical uh, disinfection. And someone in the in the in the first lecture today mentioned that what the pyrolysis, the plasma arc actually, the plasma arc actually is also used for disinfection purpose. You know, this plasma torch basically can generate temperature as high as 20,000 degree centigrade at the core. And you know, this 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 plasma technology has been used uh, or at least tried uh, for the for the uh, disinfection, in fact, it's not only disinfection; it's a pyrolysis. So basically, we disintegrate our waste uh, in, of course, in in the absence of oxygen. And there is a someone uh, I read somewhere that they are trying actually ten facilities in India, and one of them is at Goa Medical College with a capacity of 15 kilogram per hour. That means 15 kilogram of waste. Uh, can be disintegrated, which of course is low, but this was a demonstration plant, I think. So another uh, another facility. Uh, so what has happened is with this uh, treatment facilities, because you know many of our uh, healthcare units or clinics, etc., could be a very small size. For example, five bed, ten bed. In fact, even no beds. You know, very small. There are only one doctor and just. A small uh, hospital or small facilities there. So, if you ask them that you know they should have uh, a facility, independent facility, dedicated facility for waste management, that probably won't work because first of all, the the cost will be really high, and probably there won't be any space, and then there will be, it will be too difficult for someone to ask having just a five-member hospital saying that oh you need two person to uh, to deal with the biomedical waste. So the what is proposed and what is done is that there are common biomedical waste treatment facilities. What is the idea that the wherever the biomedical waste is, is uh, produced, it is collected by the facilities and then dealt in a particular place. For example, they have incinerators, they have microwave, uh, they have uh, let us say autoclaving facilities and then of course they have the landfill facility. So that instead of having individual facilities which or having captive facilities which probably won't be possible for very small hospitals, this common waste biomedical treatment facility can take care of them. So this, uh, every, this is all what I uh, to tell uh, about the biomedical waste management to my students. Uh, 
in small towns, uh, for example, with the population of 5 lakhs or so, they also have, uh, in fact, it is not encouraged now, but they also mentioned that the deep burial is also a lot. So what do you do? You have a 2 meter deep trench and you fill your waste up to, let's say, 50 centimeter uh, with, uh, let's say, 1.5 meter you fill with the, uh, with the biomedical waste and after that you fill it with the lime. Uh, so lime actually is a disinfectant, so in fact that is why it is put up on the top of that. And then you take, make sure that uh, no one enter this facility and it is away from the stray animals, etc. Dog should not dig it in and it should be away from groundwater, etc. This is not encouraged now, but uh, if you have a very small town and there is no way out, there is no place to put your waste, probably in those places this can be tried. But remember that wherever we store it, if the flooding, etc. we happen, then probably it will contaminate the whole water in the area. Okay, so this is only recommended for the small towns, etc. So this is uh, all I uh, tell to my student about biomedical waste, uh, etc. And the another thing which I uh, also cover for my uh, student is e-waste. But before we go to e-waste, I just want to give you a small assignment uh, so that you can answer it and maybe I will take a few questions because it may be interesting to know how you deal with different things in your class. So this is a, this is a small assignment I generally ask my student to do. Maybe I, I request you to do it in let us say in 5 to 7 minutes and then I will ask you that what you have solved and what are the answers to these questions. So maybe I will uh, give 5 minutes to all of you and then probably we will uh, interact with 4 or 5 centers. So how much, so how is MSW managed in your city? So you have to write, of course we will know it, but what is the name of your city and what is the approximate population and what is your opinion? Are you satisfied with your MSW management in your city or not? Or what do you think, what should be done and what is actually happening and what should be done? So these are the three questions I would request you to uh, to do now so that we can talk about that and then maybe also take a few of your questions that what should we cover and what is not covered in biomedical and municipal solid waste. Five minutes for answering this. You may feel free to, uh, to talk to your uh, friends who are from the same city and they may be knowing something which you may not be knowing, okay, and then we will talk. Okay, Coimbatore. Yeah, so can you answer the question, please? Ah, uh, yes, sir. The first question is how is MSW managed in your city? Yeah. Uh, so in our city, in Coimbatore city, the municipal corporation is co collecting the waste uh, door by door, their doorstep itself, and then the collected waste are stored in a particular place in the which one? Four, per uh, four street as well as uh, five street corner, and then it will be collected through. Which are municipal lorries to the which are the dumping yard. And the second question is: Are you satisfied with your uh, MSW management? And you are we are really satisfied with this uh, which one program. What if I die is back? Uh, a Coimbatore management patient tried a, uh, a, 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 which one? a Guinness record of uh, uh, which one? delayed. So in the uh, different segregations, that means recyclable, recyclable as Organic, that means in the case of organic as well as uh, which one non uh, combustible, sorry, which one uh, the decombustable uh, materials. Uh, third question in our opinion, how the MSW should be uh, which one manage uh, in your city? Yeah, a uh, which one uh, standard, uh, which one standard as well as a particular area, means the Vellore dumping yard. In the dumping yard, uh, we are collecting the waste as well as the corporation is spending a lot of money for that one. Uh, that means a more volume of budget uh, to make, uh, we have a, a plan to make a, in the dumping yard, uh, we have a plan to make as you say, as uh, like you said, that means uh, making of garden uh, as well as uh, the golf yard we are going to make. For the first two questions, my colleague has given an answer and the third question with respect to the satisfaction, sir. 
our corporation commissioner along with some ngos are organizing zero waste management a project called dunya project we are organize we are managing the solid waste management with respect to the zero waste management so we are satisfied with that sir along with the municipal corporation some more over ngos are also taking part in that sir so when you say zero so waste we also, management we along so with the youngsters are also playing a vital role in that okay very good but zero but, waste management sir yeah but what are you doing with then uh, this dirt and dust now we are collecting it and, and we are segregating it sir on a degradable waste and non degradable waste okay but what are you doing with non degradable waste we are segregating it and after yes sir we are going with non degradable waste sir okay but what are you doing after segregating then after sending it it will be recycled sir okay very good but the process we will be sending it for the process of recycling oh very good okay but i personally think that uh, you know uh, there are some certain some uh, portion will be remaining which probably need to be dealt in a landfill or in in somewhere else so it's amazing that you have started to okay. work on zero waste concept i wish you luck and do you have any other question okay thank you sir okay. thank you very much sir okay hello agra hindustan institute so can you answer the three questions yes sir uh, one of the details which i have on my pc that is laptop is that we have a population of 14.27 lakhs in agra which is an urban population okay and uh, we have the total length of the roads uh, roads 1724 kilometers we have 200 open dumps nine dhalaws 116 dustbins and uh, 2865 safai karmacharis are being deployed for this very good and Second. we have 96 vehicles doing the job day in day out for mswm activity okay and are you satisfied and the expenditure and the expenditure is 28.1 crores annually for dumping this for dumping the msw annually this is annual figure okay and are you satisfied Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, if we compare it with the other cities in Uttar Pradesh, uh, yes, Agra can be considered as one of the okay cities. I will say okay city, not one of the best, but okay city as far as MSW is concerned. Very good. But is there any treatment happening? Uh, recycling? Are you referring to? Yeah, recycling, uh, composting, sanitary landfilling. Uh, as far as physical observation of. Uh, as is concerned we don't have any recycling plant as such landfilling. but landfilling is still there but is it open dump or is a landfill landfilling landfilling okay okay any other question you have uh, thank you sir it was a good presentation as far as uh, this msw is concerned we would like to uh, uh, take it as a project for the students in our classes sure sure uh, but as such we don't have environmental or biotechnology branch with us so that this can be done but yes definitely the presentation is very good thank you sir okay thank you st gates college so please answer those three questions so we get a perspective what's happening in terms of waste management in kerala yes, sir actually uh, you know city uh, there is a treatment plant uh, arranged uh, by the government uh, oh. the treatment is done by the uh, municipal municipality itself okay what treatment they are mainly uh, doing uh, landfill uh, by this bio waste ah okay landfilling or bio waste so are you satisfied with the treatment facility in your city no 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 okay what should be done then so actually we need to go for any kind of uh, you, uh, other than this landfilling we, we should go for uh, such a way that we can produce any energy from this uh, bio waste okay 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 thank you hello st joseph college kottayam so can you answer those three questions please yeah we are from kottayam city and uh, our population is uh, 6 to 7 lakhs approximately and uh, the waste management is by dumping actually there is a dumping yard at wadavadur uh, that is not a proper way there is a lot of resistance from the local populace uh, actually it should be separated and uh, treated in a scientific way uh, that should be the way it should be done actually okay so what do you recommend to your city what should be done sorting and then sorting and then uh, uh, dealing each type of waste 
separately okay and uh, our students also have done a study on that area actually project work the ground water is also contaminated because of the uh, what to say number of years of dumping over there okay so even ground water is contaminated in the area wow contaminated yes oh, and okay. there is a lot of, lot of uh, local resistance the people are uh, uh, what to say uh, garawing the ministers and things like that so that the things get uh, set right and their uh, life is healthy okay very good so do you have question for us for me your class was good we appreciate we uh, what is it it was informative and uh, okay thank so, you so you also teach more or less the same thing in the class or it's different from what i teach and what you teach it's different uh, uh, what i personally deal the subjects with, which i deal but uh, out of interest i have sat in this no i mean in actually. environmental studies do you uh, teach solid waste management and that no 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 i i do not teach environmental studies for the engineering students okay thank you so it was interesting to talk uh, to uh, some of you it was uh, you know it's all of us know that in many places still we are not uh, dealing up with our uh, with our waste scientifically but uh, it looks like in few cities there are taken some steps for example at least the storage generation and collection is happening in little bit better coimbatore uh, city of coimbatore they said that we are moving towards zero waste so that's very interesting and we have to see that how it has worked and how successful it would be in future and then whether it can be implemented in other cities also okay so in addition to uh, this uh, this biomedical waste uh, i in fact cover very uh, briefly the electronic waste also uh, which is uh, you know a very important uh, component of solid waste and more so will be important in future because of the first of all the the trends for example we are producing more and more electronic waste i remember you know for many years we used to have a, you know one tv and that lasted for many many years and then out of sudden we started having many tvs and same is with the phones and everything every now and then in 2 3 years we every one of us is having a new mobile phone so electronic waste is uh, one of the major important concern for many of us you know uh, so what is electronic waste in fact is the waste generated in the form of electric and electronic equipments and which is no more required by the by the user at the first place uh, it includes household appliances for example refrigerators toasters etc it and telecom devices computers printers and then consumer equipments like radio mp3 player cell phones cell phones more and more actually and then lighting equipments electric and electronic tools automatic dispensers medical instruments detectors toys even electronic toys are there so basically there are many many types of waste which in in the category of electronic waste which is we are generating and more so will be generating in future how much of that we generate in the country there are different numbers uh, there is a little bit of uh, ambiguity in this but uh, by one study in uh, 2010 says that and that's actually that 2010 study was based on the national waste electric and electronic equipment task force which was developed, which was set by government of india they said that we generate 146 tons of waste in a year and however one study in 2000 says that it's 330000 tons per year in 2009 there are some another study which says it's 420000 tons per year so nevertheless it's i think in the range of 2 to 4 uh, 100000 tons per year that's a lot of waste we are generating and please remember that is not including the waste which is coming to the country uh, illegally actually because there is a lot of waste imported to our country legally as well as illegally also so that is not included in this that means we, the, this number is it should be much much higher out of the waste which is generated in the country we are generating a lot of waste in terms of refrigerators for example 100000 tons of refrigerators 275000 tons from TVs that's very interesting and then 56000 from personal computers 4700 tons from printers so actually in future this refrigerator will be going up 
TV is I would say in terms of the total mass, total tonnage it should certainly be go no, down because the mass uh, has d decreased because we are using less cathode rate based tu um, tube based TVs, but you know the mobile phone etc. we are increasing day by day. So that is another problem which uh, our country will be facing or is already facing in fact and the biggest problem is that if we are not managing it properly that means a good amount of it is going into our municipal solid waste. And if it is going into municipal solid waste then it cre creates another kind of problem for our biological treatment systems and also for incinerator because then many of the flue gases generated uh, would be toxic in nature. Okay? Uh, it is generated from individual houses, public and private sectors, manufacturers, retailers, importers and it is very com complex. You may be understanding that when I ask you what is inside your mobile phone, tell me the components. You can tell there are so many things, paper, uh, this plastic, there may be uh, copper, there may be even some say it's, it's gold, etc. But as e-waste can consist, can have thousands of hazardous and non-hazardous elements. That is the biggest problem. Uh, many of them have a direct impact on our health and many of course would have, will have indirect impact. So, uh, for example, we do not have a very good study for India, but for Europe, for the Europe they did a study and they realized that 47 or 48 percent of our the electronic waste basically is iron and steel and 15 percent is non-flame ret retardant uh, plastic and 5 percent is retardant plastic, 7 percent is copper and approximately 5 percent is or even less than that is aluminum and then there are other materials. So, if you see in, in nutshell we have plastic, we have uh, iron and steel and we have aluminum and we have copper. So, many of these industries who are working in illegally or legally in India in uh, unorganized sectors actually they are more interested into the extraction of basically copper and aluminum and in some cases they say even we can extract small amount of gold etc. There are several of these components in electronic waste, they are hazardous in nature. For example, the lead, the new story nowadays, everyone is talking about lead, lead, but basically if you see lead, it is neurotoxin, that means it is toxic to neurons, it affects kidney, reproductive system, high quantity can be fatal, affects the mental development in children, etc. So basically, all these heavy metals, lead, chromium, mercury, beryllium, cadmium, antimony, arsenic, they all exist in our electronic waste. and many of them are not at all are good for our health and you know then there are these polychlorinated bio, biophenyls even if we burn some part of that then can be converted that eventually are converted into dioxin and furon. So that is a new kind of threat that kind of new problem in terms of our waste management and how we are uh, dealing with that or what can be done actually I would say the most of the components of our electronic waste or any electronic waste are recyclable and reusable. Only the thing is a few of them are in very small quantities, so extraction of them is complicated and very expensive also for example. Okay, so we can extract at least many of metals, even plastic, etc. and the remaining is can be disposed in the landfills and even in the incinerators. Okay. In India, most of our electronic waste activities are actually performed manually and by unauthorized sector you will find that there are several videos or several stories that how badly this electronic waste is managed and actually you will find that to extract this copper etc they are using either acid or sometimes even burning plastic etc just in open. So they are generating lot of uh, air pollution and you know that is another uh, kind of big source, I do not know how big but a good source of air pollution and all kind of problem. And then think of that acid, basically they are just uh, putting uh, your uh, let us say electronic boards etc. into the acid. So basically this, this wire, this plastic etc. is just removed, just charred out and the remaining copper or aluminum etc. is extracted. And then acid etc. is once it is of no value that is actually discharged in, into the our sewers, etc. So, that is another kind of complex problem has, has, has emerged. You may be knowing that it is informal sectors, no safety gears. In fact, they, the people work in very poor conditions. So that means we need an organized and formal e-waste management. I do not think there are, I think we have 10 plus facilities, organized facility in India. 
but in future we need more. Okay. Uh, we have a very interesting rules which came very recently in 2011 and they were implemented from uh, May 2012. Basically these rules clearly says that what is included in, in e-waste management and, and handling rules. I just want you to uh, read the, those what is covered in under e-waste management. Please spend one minute in reading what is what comes under e-waste management. So you, if you see in this, in this slide, largely every kind of electrical and electronic equipment which we used in our houses, in our offices, etc., is covered under this. Most of the elements are there. And now uh, we have uh, our rules has uh, entered the new uh, responsi responsibility for the producer, which is called extended producer responsibility. That means those uh, large companies who are producing electronic equipment, their responsibility does not end just by manufacturing. In fact, they are responsible for collection of e-waste, not only during manufacture, but even after. For example, if they have sold it, so there should be some centers where we can give our electronic uh, equipment back and then they should be uh, collected, transported and then even dismantled and processed uh, and that un comes under the extended producer responsibility. That means the big company has to set a centers where you can give back your electronic waste which was produced by the company and then it need to finance and organize a system where you know there should be an environmentally sound management system. So that is a very good step taken but we need to see that how it works. For example, you will find that in in coming time or in some places there already that there will be centers for example from let us say from uh, Videocon where you can take back your TV telling that okay this is the old TV I want to give it they take it back send it to recycling and then manage it very interesting then but need to see how it works okay if those companies under extended uh, responsibility do not work they will be penalized a few lakh rupees of fine and of course uh, there is even pre imprisonment but uh, so, if, if they are not even complying with this rule, probably they will be in trouble in future. That is a very positive step, but still we need to see how it works. Okay. So, you know, because I mentioned earlier also that there are so many things to talk, to tell about solid waste management and depending upon how many lectures you take, how many, in how many lectures you have to cover in your course, they have to decide what to be covered and what not to be covered, but because in my classes I have to cover it in four lectures or so, so I do not go beyond that. I just cover that part and many times I give couple of assignments which uh, some of the questions I already have uh, given to you also. Uh, these are the few books which I used for solid waste management. Uh, for example, one is Introduction to Environmental Engineering and Science. It is written by Gilbert Mars, uh, Masters and uh, Wendell Ella. It is interesting book. It is published in India now and I think it is not that expensive also because it is Indian uh, version of that. Some of information is of, uh, of India is also available there. And then there is an int, uh, interesting and standard book of environmental engineering uh, by P. V. Rowe, famously called P. V. Rowe and it is written by Howard uh, P. V. Donald Rowe and George Shobna Gloss. And then you nowadays we have a lot of web resources. EPA website, United States Environmental Protection Agency, Center Pollution Control Board, our own Pollution Control Board, MSW rules, etc. And then UNEP, etc. They have all this information for our, uh, for our whatever we are teaching. So I generally refer these books and in fact you will find that there are hundreds good books uh, written on this subject, okay, in addition to the electronic resource. So this is what I teach on uh, solid waste management largely. Uh, tomorrow I will talk about what I teach on global warming and climate change in one lecture briefly. Uh, so we have just two minutes. So if you have a couple of questions, we can take probably. Rajaram Bapu Institute, uh, where? Sangli. So in terms of solid waste management, there is a basic problem regarding the sector of waste. So, do we have any proper segregation method so that at least we can segregate that waste and whatever segregated waste which is organic in nature, so that can be utilized for the uh, generation of uh, uh, <coughs> composting as well as for the different type of uh, energy uh, sources. 
very good question and yes we have a very good segregation method and that is you and me i and you segregated nothing better than that <laughs> okay so the point is that once we do not segregate once we do not segregate it manually or by at, at our homes and then we mix it and then want to segregate it then probably we need to use a series of series of systems right and then depending upon whether your waste is dry semi dry wet what kind of conditions one technology may work another may not work so the best thing is to segregate by me and you if not then use all expensive technology which will segregate it partially be it on the size be it be on the basis of you know then manual sorting etc there is no standard technology which can solve all our problem after uh, as we know in terms of uh, iit bombay we are practicing different type of municipal solid waste uh, management things in which we are segregating that waste but after segregating that waste it is not properly collected and disposed by the government of uh, or uh, local government municipal government of mumbai so do we have any comment on this one no we have to push them we have to find some ways we have to find the governments which agree to deal with the waste and i think that's the way it is it's not i and you can comment into it okay it's already 5 so thank you very much uh, sangli people should come quite frequently to iit bombay you are the closest one probably then we will talk about tomorrow what are the remaining questions bye bye thanks very much thank you everyone across the country please send your comments please send that what you teach please uh, discuss on the forum that what do you what other things should we teach in a 4 to 5 hours lectures and then everyone will be helped uh, or benefited by that thank you uh, for today and since you tomorrow bye bye